My co-hosts this evening, Mark Ingham from Ingham Analytics and Kevin Lings from Stanlib. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. It's been about the US debt ceiling. We seem to be on a path here to kicking the can down the road for a short period of time. But it appears inevitable we're going to bring Andrew Cantor into the discussion just in a moment down in Cape Town that a US debt downgrade is inevitable. It looks highly likely, you would say, um, certainly from SMP. I don't know if Moody's will downgrade, but obviously uh, you would say that they get um, the debt ceiling raised after the vote today. Uh, they're going to do it in two tranches, it looks like. So the first tranche would be in the order of 900 billion US dollars. That gets them uh, out of a default situation. And then later, around November, they've got a committee to look at a further increase in the debt ceiling and that gets uh, quite complex in terms of the structure around that. Uh, I think SMP have taken a fairly hard line, Standard & Poor's have taken a fairly hard line in terms of what they would look to be put in place. Uh, that hasn't really happened even with the current agreement. So you may see a downgrade from SMP and you may see Moody holding the rating at AAA and you might get a mixed result. Uh, I think what we need to look at is what does that mean for the markets? Um, and there's a whole lot of potential debates around that. Ultimately, though, my view is that there's nothing to replace the U.S. in terms of its role in the global financial system right now. So I'm not convinced a huge amount changes as a consequence. Mark, how are you feeling about the, the current situation? Gee, I'm hysterically ecstatic, what <laughs> can I say? I mean, here you've got a country with a AAA credit rating and a triple C political rating, you know, the two just simply don't go hand in hand. Um, so where to from here? What's well, quite interesting that long rates actually, if anything, have been uh, strengthening in yeah, the well. last while. Um, and uh, that's probably signaling uh, that, that the markets are expecting anemic, continued anemic growth mm. going, going forward, whether they agree on something or not. So it's a case of fiddling while Washington burns, I guess. Um, and I think people are, are just uh, probably factoring in the weight of probability that ultimately, hopefully, reason to some degree in this new insane world uh, will pertain. Uh, given the, um, the, the, the linkages that uh, Kevin's just referred to, uh, the US into the uh, rest of the world, and the Chinese also can't really afford uh, for the US to yeah. go bust either. You know, they're the biggest paymaster, and they also depend on the country as a, as a customer. So there's an unholy alliance there, too. Andrew, let's throw this down to you in Cape Town. Of course, Andrew Cantor, the CIO of Future Growth. Shock and horror at a potential debt downgrade, or is it a given, as I've just said to, to Kevin and to Mark in studio? Yeah, you know, it, it, it should be a given um, if the ratings agents are doing their jobs properly, which is always questionable. Um, but really, who cares? I mean, you know, ratings agencies, as far as I'm concerned, are supposed to be doing financial analysis, in expressing an independent view of borrowers, and yet I see them repeatedly sitting at a political table in Europe about, about those various downgrades, and now in the U.S., uh, and not actually taking proactive uh, movements on these things. I mean, the U.S. debt to GDP ratio is 100% rising at a pace. If you're taking the total present value of the unfunded liabilities of the US, U.S. government, the debt to GDP is 400% by some estimates. It's scary. They should have been downgraded already. Well, precisely, they should have been downgraded if we've been debating whether they can repay their debt or not for the last couple of weeks. But moving swiftly along, and, and let's not do any rating agency bashing tonight. I've been accused of that before on this news desk. Let's look at what's happening to bond yields in the, the U.S., and specifically at the 10-year bond yield. Uh, earlier today, sitting at 2.79%. Any fluctuation on that front? It's not ticking up, and, and certainly what are bond yields telling us? Well, well, interestingly, bond yields, and now I see the equity market today, are telling us that what really matters here is economics. And the, the flow of data from the global economy in general, South Africa in particular, and the U.S. in particular, is the economy's weak. I mean, you've had two months in the U.S. of very weak jobs growth, and there's been some further big layoffs this, this month in the last week or so. Uh, global port, um, uh, production manufacturing indices are weak. Uh, we saw that again this morning in South Africa where the, the PMI index uh, was down sharply by sort of nine points to 40, 43 or 44. I mean, the global economy is weak, and that's what bond yields are really telling you is don't worry about inflation at this point. Worry about deflation. Yeah, I think the U.S., it's a strange, uh, what appears to be a strange situation because 
You've had all of this discussion about downgrades and the debt ceiling. Yes, the bond market, where you would think the bond market would weaken, hasn't. And I agree with what Andrew's saying. The bond market is choosing to focus on what it perceives to be the worst of the two risks, and the worst risk being uh, anemic growth or even a return to recession conditions. So the bond market very worried about the latest round of local uh, U.S. economic data and then the general data around the world. Um, I think, though, if you look at uh, the credit uh, default swaps on the U.S., they have moved higher. In other words, uh, if you look at the risk of default, if you like, it is pricing in some concern, but then in itself it's not uh, suggesting a massive increase in concern. Before we go any further with the debate, let's take a look at that economic picture emerging out of the U.S. And here's just a, a quick update. The ISM Manufacturing Index was released this morning and it fell sharply in July to 50.9. That's from 55.3 in June, surprising the market on the downside and the lowest reading in the index in two years. And of course, U.S. GDP for the second quarter increased at just 1.3 percent year on year after increasing 0.4 percent in the first half revised downwards now some highlights include a slowdown in export demand stronger federal spending and an improvement in non-residential fixed income at this juncture would you be backing the eurozone over the u.s uh, neither, in fact, uh, you know, probably going to some uh, some sort of desert island, uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I, I guess it's a case of in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I'm just trying to work out which is the one-eyed man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, squarely in South Africa, then, is this one of the safest places well, to be? Do you it's think probably not? not too bad. I mean, there are some issues we need to deal with, including government wage inflation and uh, various other things. Uh, but maybe we are the one-eyed man. I don't know. Well, it is what is coming across very clearly is that the developed world is are face, is facing a lot of structural headwinds. Um, it's obviously facing low growth. It's facing all these debt constraints in terms of government. And the the notion that we've I've certainly been putting across for quite some time is that emerging markets are going to grow up more and more and will play a much bigger role in the world economy. And, and the latest uh, debacle in the US and in Europe just reiterates that as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't mean emerging markets are perfect. They're far from it. But the factors that lead to economic growth are more substantial and more evident in emerging markets. The problem for South Africa is that we're not able to move ourselves firmly into that emerging market space, mainly because we just don't create jobs. Following Mohammed Al Arian, joint CEO of PIMCO, I'm not sure whether it's your favorite quote or my favorite quote that we're going to see anemic growth in the developed world and emerging markets will continue to dominate for some time out. Andrew, let's throw this back to you. Looking at the picture on the international front, bring it home. What does it mean for South Africa and specifically for South African bonds? Okay, so um, the the bonds have been rallying in the last uh, couple of weeks. We've seen about a thirty point rally. So your your ten year yield, uh, standardized ten year yield, is down at about eight twelve eight eight point one five percent, which is is reasonably low considering we think inflation is going to be running in the mid fives to up to six percent this year, or in the next year. So so we've had a good rally, and with global growth uh, uh, on the on the slowdown for the moment, with the, the Reserve Bank uh, likely pushing out bank rate hikes to probably at least March of next year when we. All been expecting even September or November this year, and maybe even longer after that, depending on how things evolve. Uh, the bonds probably have a little bit of a tailwind right at the moment because equities are going to be a bit of a scary place. We are still a commodities exporter, and our markets uh, will be driven by that. Although I must say, I buy the big uh, macro theme the panel was just talking about, where emerging markets are the safe haven. We, safe haven. we are the one eyed man or the desert island, if you prefer, where we have reasonably good fiscal policy for now uh, and a reasonably stable currency. Andrew, I'd be quite interested uh, from your uh, point of view as to where your market positioning would be. If you're looking at asset allocation currently, taking into account the very pertinent points that you raise, what would your, your uh, underlying uh, recommendation be? Look, one has to be on the horns of a dilemma here because um, equities, equities um, are actually relatively cheap in the first case on a price earnings ratio relative to cash yields, which is zero, or bonds now at 2.7 percent. I wouldn't touch U.S. bonds with a barge pole. And equities um, earnings are coming through quite nicely. The question really is how it evolves from here. So my personal bias, believe it or not, despite everything we've just said, is, is probably long equities. The Fed is trying to create inflation. They're trying to rubbish bond investors. Cash is trash. I mean, you've got to be in risk assets. Now, property in the U.S. ain't the place to be. 
be. And even domestically, it doesn't look so interesting. We're seeing shops closing and such. So I, I've got to, you've got to put the money somewhere. And, and I, I'm feeling like it's got to be in equities. That said, and one of the interesting dynamics of a US debt, senior, debt downgrade of the government is corporates are in better shape than government. You could see further credit compression. I heard somebody say earlier they've got nowhere else to go. Well, they can go into credits. Um, and so I think you could see credit spread compression relative to U.S. Treasuries as a, as a sort of a, a escape valve for some money, but it's just not going to be big enough. Well, interesting that we have uh, the, the CIO else. of the biggest independent fixed income house in South Africa backing equities at this stage. And Kevin, I know you've got a question for him. Andrew, can I just ask you in turn, it's a bit of an unfair question, but how would you play currencies? Let's say that you'd gone offshore now and you were taking a, a, a sizable amount of money and you were trying to pick a currency exposure, would you be buying what could be perceived as fairly expensive currency like the Swiss franc? Uh, would you be going into what is obviously a very weak dollar with the risk that it weakens? How, how would you be playing the currency situation? Good Lord, that is, a, that is a bit of an unfair question. I see there's a high level of sarcasm on the panel tonight as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't actually know, Kevin. I mean, I, I watch these wild swings between the euro and the dollar and the, and the structural steady uh, rising of the, of the Chinese yuan. I'm not really sure, but right now you kind of feel like the euro, the euro is going to weaken again uh, relative to the dollar as we, as we move through this current phase of fear in the U.S., and we shift back towards the fear of how Europe evolves. Remember, we've got this Italy thing brewing in the background, and the markets aren't going to let, let the European uh, Eurozone get away with what they've just tried to get away with. The, the numbers are just too big. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that, that pendulum start shifting back to U.S. dollars in the short term. But, you know, I, I, would, I would probably go with a balanced portfolio of the big currencies, and, and a lot of people are favoring gold as a, as a hedge, and then some emerging market hard currencies, if interesting choice of terms, Aussie dollars, rands, can Canadian dollars, and the like. Andrew, what do we focus on now when it comes to, to your environment in terms of news flow, expected news flow? Right. Well, we always focus on inflation as the f key long-term indicator for bond investor. And right now, with inf inflation was expected to go up and stay up with the cycle. And I think people are really reevaluating that now. Uh, uh, you know, global unemployment, uh, excess productive capacity, uncertainty, uh, deflationary risk. So the inflation numbers are going to start being revised down in the next in the next month or so. And I mean inflation going out to 12, 24 months. And I think that's going to help the bond market um, and, and, and probably help the economy ultimately as, as the Reserve Bank doesn't raise rates. Um, and beyond that, just the factors we're talking about, the key risk factors being Europe. That story is not over. It's going to play out later in the summer, uh, or certainly in the autumn um, and, and such. It's not a finished story. So we'll be watching that for the risk aversion trade and whether that hurts the RAND. Eventually, it shouldn't, by the way, it should help the RAND. But in the first blush of further European crisis, the RAND could go down a bit before recovering. Uh, and th those are probably the things we're watching. Andrew, can I just push you a little bit on something you've said now and what you said earlier on? And that is that you would still favor risky assets, yet you arguing that fairly anemic growth, inflation gets revised lower. That's kind of favoring the bond exposure. Is there a time horizon I'm missing here? Or, or how would you be playing bonds versus equities? Yes, it's a, it's a, thanks for catching, catching me on that. It has to do with, of course, what's in the price. So you know, we, I can say all those things I've just said about the risk of deflation, and we have to be watching that and watch the downside risk. U.S. Treasuries are 2.73% now. I mean, I, you don't want to touch those. On a, on a 30 year or even a 60 year view, that is a sell. And, and the Fed is pumping liquidity. They're going to create inflation one way or another. Eventually, cheap money will drive growth. That's my core proposition. In, in the macro sense, for the last 20 years, you've had this big reshift of enormously cheap Indian and Chinese labor coming to the system, undercutting jobs in the West. And, and so you've had deflation labor in the West. I think eventually that starts to stabilize, and you hopefully start getting moderate global growth. So I'm still a, I'm still a risk on growth oriented person on the longer term view and what's in the price bonds are overvalued equities are relatively cheap that's where I'm going with this story Kevin before I throw this back to to mark just looking at the Chinese manufacturing numbers out earlier today also at a 28 year low so things aren't hunky-dory in in China either I'm still with you Andrew uh, sorry yeah well but I mean China you know how many of us would kill for eight percent growth you know what I'm saying? I'm sorry, I didn't see those numbers today, but everybody's been expecting a China, a China landing. It was only a question of whether it was soft or hard. Uh, and so far, it seems like it's been a relatively soft landing, uh, a managed descent, if you will. Andrew, it's quite interesting, actually, with all this, uh, this uh, sort of liquidity, um, is that you're pushing on a piece of string. You can have as much uh, of this uh, 
cash sloshing around the system as you like. It's not uh, seemingly impacting real economic uh, um, action on the ground. And I'm just wondering that after a period of excess, a number of years of excess, we need, uh, we need a sort of catharsis. And, and at some point, uh, sort of politically too, it's got to be accepted that um, uh, one is perhaps going to have to live with fairly, fairly sort of sluggish growth numbers in the key Western economies until such time as that, uh, that uh, sort of excess is out of the way. Sure. The, the, the pent-up demand in the U.S. is still there. Remember, we're going sort of into four or five years into this sort of downdraft um, and you, get, you do get pent-up demand. People stop spending for a period of time, and, and eventually when the cycle turns and, and confidence returns to both businesses uh, in particular and consumers, uh, you can get a real upswing off of that. And so far, the, even in the, in the bounce off the, off the Great Recession, there wasn't a huge upsurge in confidence. So U.S. corporates are hugely cash flush, looking for opportunities to start buying things, uh, I think, at some point, raising money they don't need in the bond market because it's so cheap. So, so eventually that money does come back into the system and starts getting spent, and cheap money forces it was a way that to do that. That's the whole Fed strategy. That's that's classic economics, and that's why I, I kind of have some faith that that's going to ultimately work. Uh, notwithstanding that, I do take your point about the relatively slow forward growth. Well, more data flow on the local front. South Africa's measure of manufacturing activity hit a two-year low in July. This according to the Cajiso Purchasing Managers Index, which recorded 44.2 in the past month. Now, that is compared to 53.9 in June. A reading of below 50 indicates that the manufacturing sector is contracting. This is the fourth consecutive month that the PMI has slipped down and reflects a similar trend in South Africa's key trading partners, China and the Eurozone. And a lot being put to the industrial strike action over July for yeah. this lower number. Is yeah, that look, the reality? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think we've got to describe our number as shockingly low. I mean, we're talking about the US, their PMI number fell, but it's still above 50, which suggests that there's expansion, not much expansion, but there's expansion. Our number fell well below 50, and actually some of the components fell into the 30s. Particularly, I need to highlight the employment uh, component fell deep into the 30s, which says that manufacturing is just not employing, and we've seen the employment index below 50 for quite some time. So when you break down our PMI, it's telling you industry is under enormous pressure to start with. It's, as you've said, it's been falling for four months, so it's under pressure. And then you throw on top of that all the strike activity, and clearly it pushes it even weaker. Uh, if you look forward, you would say at this stage you wouldn't expect much of an improvement in August. There's still strike activity going on, and hopefully by the time we get to September, the numbers look better. But all of this is translating into two key outcomes. One, so if because GDP outlook looks weaker, and you'll probably see downward revisions to our growth numbers. And two, nobody's hiring. Nobody's looking to employ anybody, and without jobs in, in uh, job creation, South Africa is going to struggle to move forward. Downward revisions to the GDP number in South Africa doesn't that ultimately translate into downward revisions on corporate earnings in South Africa, Mark? Well, yes, but this news you're just talking about now is not new news. In fact, post 2008, and particularly with manufacturing. All it's done is accentuate the structural problems we've been building up for many years. Um, so, you know, we probably need a good 5% GDP growth a year, which is relatively high, to create meaningful employment. And what we're seeing, and particularly with the manufacturing sector, uh, is that just simply is not happening. Um, and so companies are making do. And uh, we need to actually have a constructive debate in this country for the first time um, about a rational economic strategy insofar as job creation goes. And if, if you don't have jobs, ultimately, and we've got a growing population and a shrinking workforce, um, you know, earnings ain't going to come out of thin air for companies. Andrew, just before we, we let you go and move to the break, any thoughts on, from your side on the PMI number, the, the shocking number, as uh, Kevin alluded to, at 44.3? Right. Well, as, as I said earlier, I mean, it's one of those signs that globally economies are, are possibly on the verge of a double dip now or already even in, in a mild recession again. I think it's a transitory thing, but it is definitely coming through. The RAND strength is not helping. Uh, I hear the comments about the need for job growth. There's a, there's a camp that says we must weaken the RAND to achieve long-term structural growth. Well, there's the other camp that says that's a, a long-term debasement of the, of the currency and of the of, uh, devaluation of the nation. Uh, you get to go either side on that. I'm a, I'm a strong currency kind of person as a bond investor, I suppose. Uh, 
Um, so no, uh, the, the answer is that's why the bonds are rallying. They probably still have a little bit of wind in them, but, but eventually they run out of steam when they bump into that rising inflation number.